Well, Scotchwood Road is Scotchwood Road, and it it's just a feeling, a togetherness, a friendliness. Oh, I'm more happier there. With a 20-year plan, the people of Scotland would have nothing. I didn't like it. In fact, I cried for a few weeks. We've been saying they're going to be built for ages and I've never seen any sign. Everything needs to have, it's all gone. Planners have often been most criticised for their work in the 1960s and 70s when ideas for radical urban living were proposed. The start of these ideas were slum clearance schemes and demolishing terrace properties that were said to be no longer up to standard. The demolition of houses first began in the West End in 1955. This continued on for the next decade, with Amber Films capturing these scenes in 1971 as part of their film on demolition. This was a scheme to create a Brasilia of the North, or a city in the sky. Both aimed at embracing radical new solutions within the city. The New Jerusalem, Brasilia, an island of advanced development in an old country, as famous as Rome or Paris, the Venice of the North, a place where children can grow up and enjoy their span of life on this earth. The closure of the Scotswood and Ellswick works in 1979 led a major blow to this area. You probably have heard with a deep sense of shock. The decision of Vickers management to close down the Scotswood Works. Scotswood has played a major part in the west end of Newcastle in the industrial life of the city, providing employment for a large part of the community since the beginning of this century. We must not allow this fact to be closed for a narrow short-term consideration of profit, while ignoring the great contribution that Scotswood has made to the wealth of Vickers for countless years in the past. At the time of the First World War, more than 7,000 people were employed by Vickers Engineering on Tyneside. Now the figure's down to a few hundred, and the ones who were made redundant when closure was announced here at the Scotswood Works four months ago have now left. Last night there were only seven men on the night shift. The last 150 who were paid off this morning met in their favourite pub just across the road from the works. Since Vickers closed down, there's not much industry in the area, so if people move away to try and find jobs, as people move out of their houses, they are boarded up to stop vandalism. There are quite a lot of boarded up houses in Scotchwood. Shiny, polished face of office blocks and neat housing estates. The slum areas are disappearing as the planners scheme to give the young the flavour of a new life. The comprehensive redevelopment approach led to a displacement of tightly knit communities, separating neighbours and sending them away to new blocks in the sky. Planners at the time believed the work they were doing would improve these areas by improving living conditions. Community links are crucial for both individuals and wider areas. Separating these links can exacerbate an area's downfall. The corner shop where we are, the, the customer comes in, she can express her feelings. She'll say, oh, I'm so fed up. Don't bother to serve me, serve somebody else. I'm just having five minutes' peace away from the children. The next part of our story looks at the areas where these communities were displaced to. One of the original replacement schemes for the Victorian terrace houses was the Noble Street Flats. These were built between 1956 and 1958, consisting of five-storey tenement blocks housing 500 families. These were criticised at the time for their design, featuring communal stairways and entrance doors leading to the flats. Now recognised as poor design features for the lack of surveillance leading to antisocial behaviour. The shoots especially. They smell terrible in the summer. Me, for one, I, I don't like the place. I hate it. And I was brought up around here. The Noble Street flats were originally designed as a solution to the terrace houses, however these were demolished in 1978. The blame for the failure of the scheme is jointly responsible between planners 
architects and politicians, who were all in support of the scheme at the time. Pictured here, we can see the Victorian terrace houses being demolished, and in the background, the residential towers of Crotus Park rising from the rubble. Crotus Park was designed as towers in the park. This was another rehousing scheme for the demolished terraces. The towers in the park idea has a number of original creators, with links back to Scandinavian urbanism or even to Le Corbusier. The scheme was proposed by Wilfred Burns, the chief planner of Newcastle at the time. This was a vision for a modern Newcastle, aiming to provide high quality social housing for the families here. These provided modern amenities such as indoor plumbing and central heating, which many of the terrace houses previously didn't have. By the early 2000s, the blocks were known for a number of social problems, similar to that of the Noble Street flats. This lack of repair meant the council sought for a private sector contribution to help regenerate the flats. However, when none could be found, a number of public sector organisations came together to achieve this. Since Crudders Park was first developed, the role of a planner has seriously diminished. No longer recognised as a well-respected profession, planners had become something disliked for the failure of their earlier schemes. The result is Riverside Dean, a set of five buildings containing modern, sustainable homes. Um, we've invested um, almost 22 million, um, but the standard of the blocks is absolutely fantastic. The original scheme aimed to retain all 10 towers, five for the private sector and five for social housing. However, due to budgetary constraints and a lack of private sector interest, the revised scheme saw this slim down to four towers for social sector and one for the private sector. Good, I love the design. I love everything about it, you know, to what there were before. After Amber captured the demolition of Scotswood in the 1970s, the bulldozers would come again to this area. I don't think it was explained properly, you know, when it was all drafted out, that over the 20 year plan, the people of Scotswood would have nothing. Throughout the 1990s to early 2000s, Newcastle as a city had a steady population decline. This led to hundreds of homes being pulled down, with more scheduled for demolition. However, for a considerable time, no new homes were built. The council at the time wanted to pull down the unsatisfactory quality homes and build homes for families that could enjoy for generations. The reason for this was housing market renewal. This is a policy that aims to renew stagnant housing markets by demolishing housing units and in their place, building new units with improved quality and choice. Scotswood had been identified as one of the most extreme examples of housing market collapse in the country. This exhibited abandonment, extensive clearance, dramatic population decline and stigmatised housing areas. Well at one time, I mean, when the demolition was in progress and that up the top, they said the place looked as though it was um, being in a war. I was sad that the houses were going to get demolished. Because there's nothing here, I think the youngins will probably end up moving away. I mean, mine has, mine's moved away, he doesn't want to be in this area anymore because, because there's nothing here. The key failure of going for growth was not to perceive those existing communities in deprived areas as valuable. Relocation and isolation are common themes within comprehensive redevelopment projects. Online, there is a significant record of these demolitions thanks to the work of artists and filmmakers. These, in 2010, had the aim to explore urban and social changes in Newcastle upon Tyne. Their work has captured a point in time which would have now been lost. These demolitions in Scotswood only stopped when the Liberal Democrats took control of the council in 2004. 
A day, the UK's biggest banks are rescued by the British taxpayer, the world's central banks act together to slash interest rates, and yet the International Monetary Fund warns we're facing a major economic down. Progress was slower than planned. This led to vacant sites staying that way, with no developers wanting to take on extra risk during a period of economic uncertainty. Finally, a consortium of developers, including Keepmote Homes, was established in order to develop the site. The Scotswood Master Plan sought to increase new family housing within the area in order to regenerate this. Just over the road, behind the bus stop there, used to be the Pink Palace. It was a youth and community building full of youth workers. Uh, it isn't there anymore because the council are doing a regeneration scheme and have been for the last 12 years. Behind you, you can see that this is our new building, which is a lot different to the old Pink Palace across the road. Due to the delay in rebuilding, Many of the original residents of this area of Scotswood were displaced to other parts of the city or left the area altogether. As unlike with other demolitions, there were no new flats or housing to replace the existing. The concept for a new Scotswood was to use urban design to overcome the stigmatised connotations of the area. The role of a planning officer at this point was no longer central to the redevelopment. Rather than formulating comprehensive schemes, planning officers had just become an overseer of plans and drawings aiming to hit generic policy targets. This brings us to now, the latest development happening called The Rise. This replaced dense Victorian housing with a suburban typology. At this point in time, there is a lack of community facilities in this area, with no local centre constructed yet. On the ground in Scotswood now, there is a pleasant, albeit suburban house and development, featuring balconies and terraces overlooking the River Tyne. However, there is one notable element of this residential development. This comes from the steep sloping site of the Tyne Valley. Previously, the streets of terraces used to run north to south. This allowed the streets to climb the hills, of which terraces would step down towards the river. In stark contrast, the streets are now orientated east to west. Therefore, in order to overcome the site levels, large retaining walls have been constructed. This has been coined the Great Wall of Scotswood. This refers to a large number of retaining walls located within the house and development. The retaining walls are highly visible from within the site. Some are within residence gardens with a 10 metre difference in height between properties. The issue with this design of creating development plateaus is baking a large infrastructure cost into the development. These retaining walls are expensive to install and also require maintenance throughout their lifespan. These also have a stark visual impact on the design of the overall neighbourhood. Only 400 out of the 1,800 homes proposed have actually been delivered on site so far. According to the New Tyne West Development Company, only 100 homes are being completed each year for the next five years. This means the site being constructed at this rate will not be complete for another 14 years. Nonetheless, it's still early days for the redevelopment of Scotswood and the lifespan of the rise is yet to be seen. Footage here shows the vicar from St Matthew's Church wandering the streets surrounding the church. Many of these properties are in a state of decline with broken windows. Some children can be seen playing in the streets. However, on the whole, the place looks deserted. These are the areas surrounding Summerhill. What's not clear from my research is why some areas of terrace houses were retained and others demolished. There are two clear examples of terrace developments that have been retained in the West End. The first is the terraces on and surrounding Westgate Road. This area has now become a vibrant centre for immigrants and refugees who have influenced the development's area in recent years. The streets surrounding Westgate Road are full of terraces. For the majority, none of these are of any architectural significance. However, for the most part, these have survived demolition. 
there is a low number of visible vacant properties in this area. The feel of the area is one that is alive and bustling. What I still struggle to understand is why these terraces were able to be retained, whilst others in Scotswood and Ellswick faced a wrecking ball. The second example is Summerhill Square, where we can see the footage of the vicar wandering these streets. This is the only conservation area in this section of the West End. This is an early residential development on the outskirts of Newcastle City Centre. A serene and relaxed atmosphere in comparison to the bustling and busy West Road. Summerhill is a residential oasis next to the city. This area suffered a similar level of decline to other parts of the West End. However, this area was not demolished and has seen a slow but continuing renaissance. This area features buildings of greater architectural significance in comparison to the West Road, which might state why this area was retained. These two areas of the city demonstrate what the terraces of Scotswood could have been if they had been allowed to remain.